is a, a renowned journalist, author, and commentator who has made an indelible mark on the media landscape through his insightful analysis, fearless reporting, and unwavering commitment to social justice. With over 30 years of experience in the field, Roland has been a prominent voice in television, radio, and digital media. His work has encompassed a wide range of topics, including politics, culture, race, and social issues, and he consistently uses his voice and his platform to shed light on the stories and perspectives that often go unheard. Throughout his career, Roland has received numerous accolades and recognition for his outstanding contributions to journalism and broadcasting. He has been honored with multiple awards, awards including the prestigious Peabody Award, and has been named one of the 150 most influential African Americans by Ebony Magazine. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing Roland Martin's unique insights wisdom, and perspectives on the critical issues facing our society. His ability to analyze complex matters with depth and clarity, combined with his passion for social justice, makes him an exceptional speaker who inspires action and drives meaningful change. So without further ado, I invite you to, in to join me in giving a warm round of applause as we welcome onto this stage the esteemed journalist, author, and commentator, Mr. Roland Martin. Corporate America and America loves black people. 
Some of y'all look at me like, huh? Er? Go on, let me be real clear. They love black people. They love us by. We are some of the most loyal customers in this country when it comes to companies and products. But what then happens, you then have to ask yourself, what then is the return on investment for our loyalty? And, and I'm going to use that to set up what I'm talking about. And uh, How many of y'all saw the movie uh, American Gangster? Yeah, they did. So remember when Bumpy died, they were at the house and they were having a funeral and Denzel was talking to Joe Morton. Uh, and uh, he was saying a whole bunch of people in this room oh Bumpy and then Denzel playing, uh, Frank Lucas said, I'm going to get that money. Well, that's the topic of my speech. Uh, we going to get that money. Now, anytime you're in a room with as many black people, you've got to tag your text. Now, if the person next to you has no idea what tag your text means, that means you sit next to somebody who does not go to church. Anybody go to a real black church, you hear tag your text, you know what that is. And some of y'all looking like, oh no, he talked to the white people in the room. No, there's some black people in this room who no longer go to church. And you're looking at me like, I don't know what tag your text means. I'm, I'm confused. If you're not having a money conversation, you're not having an American conversation. And, and I get a kick out of folk when we, when we have this conversation because it's always amazing how we like to run away from the money conversation when that literally is what America is all about. I remember when I was in Chicago and I was sitting down with Frank Clark and he was the CEO of ComEd. Uh, and he was talking about uh, his desire to get, first of all, I think we are streaming the speech right now live on the network. That's why so when I was setting up, that's what I was doing. So if you pull up your app, if you, have, if you haven't downloaded, download the Black Star Network app, but we're actually streaming this um, right now uh, for folks. And of course, we're restreaming multiple times as well. Um, the, the thing that's interesting to me when we, when we talk about getting money. I'm sitting with Frank, and Frank is trying to get more African-American students, especially black boys involved in science. And he says, Roland, he says, um, you know, I, I go to these schools and, and, and they ask me, you know, you know, what I'm making and what I'm driving. I was like, Frank, I'm sorry, what's the problem? I said, Frank, you're doing this thing wrong. He's like, what do you mean? I said, why is it that when we go talk to black kids, we try to tell them don't ask me about how much money I make. I said, when that's literally what the rest of America always talks about. I said, we have shows at the time, MTV Cribs, and you now with social media, you look at uh, the, the houses and the vacations and, and the watches and the jewelry. I said, Frank, I don't understand why, why are you running away from a way to connect with a new generation. He said, what do you mean? I said, okay, Frank. I said, the next time you go to a school, I want you to tell them to have all of the students assembled outside. He said, why? I said, Frank, you have a chauffeur. I need you to pull up in your chauffeur-driven car and have them watch a dude get out and open your door. I then need you to wear your best suit. I need you to wear your Rolex. Uh, I said, and then I want you to come armed with photos and videos of the cars you own and the house you live in. I said, Frank, you live in a $5 million, uh, you live in a $3 million house in the suburbs of Chicago. I said, your salary, you're a publicly traded company, your salary is public, you're making a base salary of $4 million. I said, and at a certain point during the assembly, a student is going to ask you, uh, Mr. Clark, how much money do you make? And I want you to say $4 million. I said, Frank, at that point, every student is going to be like, how the hell do you make $4 million? I said, at that point, they will be on the edge of their seat trying to figure out how is this black man I ain't never heard of making four million dollars a year. And he looked at me and he said, really, I said, 
Yes. I said, you then can explain to them, this is what you need to do to get to the position that I'm in. I said, you're running away from the thing that everybody else in this country talks about. I said, it's a mind. And the reality is that when we talk about African Americans, it is the one thing that we also historically have run away from and actually have allowed others to set an agenda. First of all, it's dark in here. Y'all turn the lights up. It's like a club in here. I need to see people. It's like club clear water. I'm just saying. It's like a little dark in here. I know the people on, on the video uh, on the stream going, damn, it's dark in there. We, it's always happened. But when, when you look at the top issues, the top issues, take turn them all the way up. Be black. We need light. If you ask the average African American the top issues, money likely will not be in the top five. We'll say education, we'll say mass incarceration, we'll say criminal justice reform, we'll say uh, housing, we'll say, but we will not say money. Even though you look at every major fundamental issue in this country, there's a direct correlation to lack of money, lack of resources, and the actual condition that our community is in. Take your pick, education, health, Crime, we can go down the line. John Hope Ryan, founder of Operation Hope, says this all the time. He says, you've never seen a riot in a neighborhood where the credit score is 700 or higher. It's a money conversation. And what should be happening now is a real reset, or what I always say, John likes to say, black America needs a reboot. Uh, I actually use the phrase, that needs to be a massive reprogramming in black America in terms of how we actually confront this very issue. Dr. King understood that. One of the things that we have allowed, we have allowed uh, white America to treat Dr. King like some civil rights bobblehead mascot who loved everybody, who wanted everybody to get along, and all he cared about was civil rights, which is a fundamental lie. Because if you look at, if you actually take time to read beyond two speeches, my God, I cannot stand when we do I Have a Dream in the mountaintop speech when the I Have a Dream speech was a radical economic speech. And if most of us actually ignore the final two minutes of the mountaintop speech, we'll realize that was a 43 minute and 16 second economic speech that he actually gave the night before he was assassinated. Because he understood the issue for us was money. And we now are in a world that I call the third reconstruction. That the first two reconstructions failed because it dealt with every other issue except money. The first reconstruction, the, the three most important things that happened, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, they call the Reconstruction Amendments. Reconstruction lasts 10, 12 years. Uh, for, if you did not have Sherman's order, 40 acres in a mule, uh, the Freedmen's Bank actually failed because Lincoln gets assassinated, uh, and you did not have a focus on economics of the freed folks who were of African descent, who were formerly enslaved. Then you go to your second reconstruction, really begins with Brown versus Board of Education, Emmett Till being uh, lynched, Montgomery bus boycott. Now what's interesting about that, we showed the power of black retrenchment with Montgomery because we broke them economically by not getting on the bus for 382 days. But if you look at all of the advancements, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, all of those were legislative, they were not financial. And so the death of George Floyd really represented the third reconstruction. And in the early days, I was saying on my show, on every platform, we cannot allow this moment to solely be a moment. It must tra be transformed into an economic movement. And it is one that needs to last at a bare minimum 20 years. Because if you go back in our history, you will realize 
that there has been no sustained period of economic advancement for African Americans that's lasted more than a decade. Take your pick. Go back to Reconstruction. And of course, you have the uh, election of 1876, the Great Compromise of 1877, ushers in 92 years of Jim Crow. Then when you go through Jim Crow, and when you go, even if you go through the years of uh, Bill Clinton, in terms of the housing, getting close to 50%, all of a sudden, uh, the, the, what happens in 2008 with the home foreclosure crisis, 53% of black wealth wiped out because of the home foreclosure crisis. So what if we had starts and stops, starts and stops, starts and stops. Not a sustained period of at least 20 years. We've never actually had that. And so it's a constant repeat. We go up, we go down, we go up, we go down, we go up, we go up, we go down, and it's not been consistent. And so here you have this moment where all of a sudden, anywhere else in the pledges go from 50 to 50 billion to 300 billion actually being pledged and while this was happening I and others were saying we must ensure that there is massive accountability every step of the way because the reality is most of that that was mostly press releases those were social media posts uh, I was in a meeting with General Motors when we were going we were uh, going after them uh, for uh, uh, their lack of black advertising, uh, those of us in black-owned media, uh, we forced them to make their changes because they were doing one percent. And then we start hitting other companies, and we begin to realize there's a whole bunch of folk who were paying lip service, but they were they were their market share was real high among black people. They literally only spending 0.2.5 one percent. So I was in, on the call with uh, their then CMO Deborah Wall, and I said, "Let me explain something to y'all." I don't applaud nobody for press releases. I will only give you credit for direct deposits. Now, I'm saying that because that has to be the starting point for every single one of us. We have got to stop rewarding people just because they bought a table. We've got to stop rewarding people because they actually showed up at our event. No, I am only going to praise somebody for consistent direct deposits for our institutions. Otherwise, all we are doing is literally giving away all the leverage influence that we have and what do we actually get out of it. I've said to our civil rights organizations, there should not, and I said, this is no disrespect to the NAACP, to NAN, to the National Urban League, but no civil rights organization should be leading any economic conversation. They should be supporting, they should be advancing, but if you ain't never run a business, how are you going to lead a conversation about business? Now I know some of you, some of you real clear with y'all, some of y'all right now, y'all like, oh damn. <laughs> some of y'all like real uncomfortable right now, and guess what? That ain't my problem. <laughs> I, I've never had a problem making folk feel uncomfortable because sometimes, actually, I'll say this, many times we spend too much time being so comfortable that what we're looking for is we're looking for affirmation and instead, what we should be seeing is a challenge for us to actually go high. <laughs> and so you look at what's happening and, and understand how I, my thought process is. When I got off the plane today, I texted, actually before I got on the plane, I texted my assistant and I said, um, the company that's picking me up, is that a black-owned transportation company? She said, let me check. She hit me back, she said no. I said, okay. Understand, I am intentional in my blackness. I am intentional to the point I then go, who are we utilizing? Who are we supporting? Saturday, I go to, I mean, I go to Houston tomorrow. I'm having a Juneteenth Black Economic uh, event. I'm born and raised in Houston. We've been celebrating Juneteenth all my life. It's new to a whole bunch of folk. 
uh, and we're trying to show black people around the country how to actually celebrate Juneteenth because Juneteenth was never about barbecues and parties. We had voter registration drives. We had economic conversations. That's what it was always about. It was this constant quest for freedom. And so we're having the event at the Power Center, which is black owned. We have black caterers doing the event. Uh, all of our vendors are black. See, we can't talk about black economic empowerment if we don't practice it. So it means being intentional. And so when I talk about being intentional, like I appreciate uh, companies when they say, well, this is all things that we're providing. But see, I got to go a little bit deeper. See, I have to challenge every single company in here. I need you to go back and then ask a separate set of questions. I need you to go back and say, how much money does our company spend every year on catering and do we have any black caterers? How much, uh, uh, who, how much money are we spending on professional services uh, law, outside law firms, outside accounting firms, and are any of them black? Are we using any outside PR companies? Are we utilizing any audiovisual companies? Are we using event organizers? What's our black owned media spend? What I'm talking about is having a much more broader eco, a black economic ecosystem because right now what's happening is we're operating in these individual silos and so you got your black CDFIs over here, you got your black folks who are in private equity, you got black folks over here fighting with black owned media and, what you, and then all the other areas, but what you do not have is you do not have a much more broader fight to expand the black economic pie. So when I hear the phrase, I hear it all the time, we need access to capital. Let me be perfectly clear, I launched my show September 4th, 2018. The day I launched my show, I was in the top percentile of black owned businesses. Why? Because if you look at pre-COVID numbers, we had 2.6 million black owned businesses, 2.5 million had one employee. Doing an average revenue of $54,000. When we had 1.9 million black owned businesses, they were doing an average revenue of 110,000. So we actually added 700,000 more black owned businesses, but the revenue was cut in half. So we actually only have 100,000 black owned businesses. We have sole proprietorships, we have lifestyle businesses. We have businesses that are actually paying bills, not actually creating wealth. So we launched, we launched September 4, 2018, seven employees. So already, we are way above everybody else. By year, by year two, and by year three, we hit three million in revenue. Ninety-five percent of black-owned businesses do five million revenue or less. And so, I'm thinking much broader in terms of how do we change the whole ecosystem? Because it can't just be we have Robert Smith, Oprah, Michael Jordan. When our focus should be, how are we creating an additional quarter of a million multi-millionaires? And not just getting hyped and celebrating because one person became a billionaire. And we then have to also be challenging them as well in terms of how are you also supporting the black economic ecosystem? And I don't mean just with gifts to a college. That's philanthropy. I'm talking about investment. We have, we, have, we have survived on corporate and white philanthropy when I'm talking about investment. But see, again, when I hear, again, access to capital, let me be clear. I have no debt. Built the company, used my own money, I owe nobody, have no partners. I don't need a line of credit. I need contracts. If I sign a $2 million advertising deal with five companies, that's $10 million. I don't need a loan. That money pays for everything. So what happens is we are allowing ourselves to also get caught in the wrong conversations. We're letting people say, oh no, I think the fundamental problem for African Americans is access to capital. No, 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 we good on the capital. I need access to contracts. Because if I got access to contracts, I got access to capital. And now, I just need working capital because you paying, as a matter of fact, let's talk about you changing your 180-day payment schedule. That's one of the things that we have been fighting with, with companies saying, look, y'all paying 180 days, 
Y'all need to bring that down to 30 and 60 for black on media. And we've been successful in doing that with some of them. So if we're talking about how are we going to redefine black America, we have to be thinking much bigger and broader and deeper than what we're doing right now because what you're already seeing, and I appreciate every corporation that's here, but what you're seeing right now is a massive pullback, which is no shock because that's also American history. Emancipation Proclamation, 1865, Reconstruction Amendments, about six or seven years in, America said, hey, we done done enough of these former slaves. Can we just move on from this stuff? So even though Reconstruction lasted 10, 12 years, you, you study the history, America about five, six years in, like, all right, we about tired of doing stuff. Now, remind me, it was 243 years of slavery. They got tired after five years. 243 years of free labor. They got tired. We done done enough. Again, 64, 64 Voting Rights, uh, Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 Fair Housing Act. Folks were like, all right, we good. Y'all got enough without realizing, no, it was a whole lot more after that. And so where we should be right now, in every facet of our community, we should be thinking much differently and challenging corporate America in a much more deeper way. If we're spending $1.5 to $1.6 trillion, I need to say, see, what are we getting back? And I'm not talking about grants and scholarships. We go to some of the meetings with companies. Hey, y'all, this is pretty funny. We go to the meeting, and they'll have um, the diversity person, and then they'll have the foundation person. Now, y'all need to understand something. I ain't scared to call nobody out. I done call Oprah out. I called Obama out. I hit anybody. We in the meeting, and I said, when y'all meet with Disney, is your foundation person here? They look at me like crap. I'm like, well, if Disney don't meet with your foundation person, I'm not meeting with your foundation person. So some of y'all look at me like, dude, what's the problem? They only bring the foundation person when they meet with black folk. Because the foundation person is there to tell us all the stuff they doing for black people. I ain't having a foundation conversation. I'm having a business conversation. They don't control the advertising budget. Where the hell is your CMO? I won't talk to your chief marketing officer. I don't want to talk to your DEI person. No disrespect to anybody who's in DEI, but it's a bullshit job. I'm sorry. What's the budget of a DEI person? How many staff was under the control? Do they have any P&L responsibility? Do they report directly to the CEO? So why we sitting here tripping and why y'all nervous as hell because I called it what it is. It's a perfunctory position. And so if I am there having a business conversation, I don't need the DEI person. I need the person who's, who has a PL responsibility over that unit because that person's job is directly tied to the bottom line of the company. And that person is in a decision-making position. So don't send me the person who's there for window dressing. And I've said to DEI folk, you need to be walking in negotiating in a much different way. I know a sister who a company came after, a major company came after her for DEI. She said, I will, and I'm talking about major company. She said, create a $1 billion fund and give me the authority to give it to who I want to give it to. They were like, oh, hell no. She says, well, I'm not coming. Because she understood what the job is about. And then, of course, 75% of all DEI positions are white. So you're trying to say you want to increase diversity, but you're hiring people who look like you. Way to go. So what I'm laying out here is we have to be operating and thinking in a totally different way if we're going to actually change the economics of our community. Frankly, 
We're thinking way too small. Many of us are going into places and we're talking about two, three, five, ten million dollars. When other folks are walking into rooms and the minimum ask is a quarter of a billion. I was talking about to Steve Perry and he met with a he met with a Wall Street guy uh, and for his uh, charter school and he said Steve was requesting five hundred thousand and so he, and he said well I was apologizing by asking for five hundred. And the guy said, Steve, let me ask you a question. He said, when Eva Moskowitz met with us and she asked what she needed, what, this is what she needed to start the success charter school, he said, how much do you think she asked for? And Steve was thinking, oh, I asked for 500, so Eva probably asked about three, four million. He said, no, she walked in and said, I need 50 million. The first time. He just sat there and his mouth wide open. If we are going to truly change the economic paradigm of black America. It is going to take our black organizations whose job is to drive an economic agenda to not sit, live in silos, but to also partner and link with one another and then begin to make a series of demands that are much higher than we've done thus far. And then once we then do that, make it perfectly clear that there is going to be a response if we get the wrong answer. Again, some of y'all look at me, damn, this dude really radical. No, I'm not, because this is called Operation Push. This is called Operation Breadbasket. You live in Philadelphia. There's a guy named Reverend Leon Sullivan. Who knows Reverend Leon Sullivan? Reverend Leon, don't be scared to raise your hand. I ain't gonna bite you. Raise your hand. <laughs> Reverend Leon Sullivan was a bad brother. Reverend Leon Sullivan was the one who was linking black businesses on the continent of Africa uh, and was having his annual conference. It was Reverend Leon Sullivan who created the Operation Bread Basket concept. He told Dr. King about it. He, King said, come to Atlanta, present to the SCOC, and he did. He said, we're adopting it, and we're gonna call it Operation Bread Basket. It is arguably the most important and successful initiative that Dr. King ever was involved in because what Operation Breadbasket did was they challenged corporate America, they challenged bread companies, they challenged uh, department stores, they challenged grocery stores to put black products on their shelves. But they didn't just do that. Get Martin Depp's book on Operation Breadbasket, 1960 to 1966, 1971, as Depp, D-E-P-P-E. -E. He, he, he was a white pastor, he was on the planning committee. What they did is they would go in and they would say, one, when they negotiated, they didn't just want jobs. They just want senior jobs. They wanted contracts going to black-owned businesses. They wanted black products on the shelves. They also wanted money from the company placed into black banks. They had a multi-pronged approach when they went and dealt with companies. And when the company said, we ain't dealing with y'all, they said, cool, we're going to go back and inform our uh, constituents, inform our uh, parishioners. And then they launched picket lines at a certain number of stores, and they got their attention real quick. What we have done in our nice, wonderful 21st century, highly educated, highfalutin, high degrees, well-dressed as black folk, we have forgot what the hell a picket line is. We have forgot what pressure is. We have forgot to understand there's nothing that black folk have ever gotten in this country that we did not get having to kick somebody's behind over. If you can show me something that we got stuff nice, take your time and let me know. I mean, just show me. But what we've done is we've taken this soft approach, but no, let me just, we can go, no, we can do the right thing, say the right thing, and stick at the door slammed in our face, and then now what? And so every single one of you, you are here representing a constituency. You're representing a constituency that you have not tapped into to actually change the economic dynamics of your community. Leaving here, you should say, how do I leave here? and go back and I'm educating not just my organization, not just my CDFI, but how am I actually educating multiple neighborhoods 
on how we need to be going after certain, yes, banks, energy companies, pharmaceutical companies, and down the line, because we are driving the bottom line of many of those companies. There's a product, my guys were at, a, at an event, there's a certain product at this company said, we, black people represent 80% of the folks who buy the product. It is a multi-billion dollar product and we drive 80%. And I've never seen one of their ads on black owned radio, on black television, or in a black newspaper. Yet we represent 80% of their buyers. You start, I had a, again, I had a conversation with an automotive company. I said, let me be real clear, I don't have to call for a massive boycott. If I knock off 1% of your market share, all oh, y'all gonna lose your jobs. They were like, what the hell? <laughs> because see, understand, I got 4 million social media followers. I will weaponize my followers to take somebody out. Because I'm not interested in black folks remaining broke. The only way this thing changes is if this generation of African Americans utilizes the power that we have, the power that our ancestors have provided for us, they provided us the blueprint and the map. The question is, are we willing to use it? A lot of us are even afraid to even post something on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok saying, well, I don't want to make somebody mad. Yet we continue to remain broke. That has to change. You either have to live your slogan or, let me be real clear, stop coming up with slogans that say unapologetically and using it in a sentence. We've got to make a decision. Are we going to operate unapologetically? Or are we going to say it because it looks cute as a slogan? That's the question that we are left with. Because right now, our community is literally fight, about to walk into a massive battle and I broke down my book, White Fear, and it's real. Y'all, this anti-CRT stuff, this ain't about education. Let me be perfectly clear. And I've been yelling this on the rooftops since 2009. Poll was taken, the question was asked, are you optimistic about the future of America for your children? Every group, except white America, the majority said yes. This was right before Obama was inaugurated. 2016, September 2016, another poll was taken. Are you optimistic about the future of America economically for the next 10 years? Black people, lowest wealth, highest optimism. I mean, anybody should be pissed is the brokest fault. Latinos, second lowest wealth, second highest optimism. White America, highest wealth, lowest optimism. Let me be perfectly clear to every CDFI CEO. You are next. If you think the attacks on CRT is not coming your way, you are dead wrong. What do you what? just happened to Bud Light. What is happening to Target? Now you're seeing the attacks on DEI. Now you're about to see an, a, a fierce unleashing against initiatives that she laid out, that others have laid out at this conference. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's been coming. Because there is a fear that we somehow are getting something no one else is getting. Under Trump, $25 billion went to, for the most part, 98% white farmers. Congress passes a bill for $5 billion 
to go to black and Hispanic farmers, and the moment it passed, Stephen Miller, that white supremacist, let they file a lawsuit, and it's been two years, and not a single black farmer has been able to access the dollar because of the lawsuit. Critical race theory. They're, that is net, I'm telling you, they're coming after every, let me, let me just state it slowly. They're coming after every corporate initiative that directly impacts black and brown communities. It's coming. And many of us, and yes, it's already here. So I need every person in this room to understand you are going to have to fortify yourself for a battle that you never was expecting. Because what they're going to do, I'm just going to tell you right now, and again, you have wonderful corporate partners here, but they're going to go after their boards of directors. They're going to use shareholder power. They're going to then begin to say, that's unfair. Why are you helping them? And not us. Now, we can sit there and lay the numbers out. And many of us are going to say, well, I don't understand what's going on. Because by 2043, America will be no longer a majority white country. I have to paint these things in stark terms because it is happening before our very eyes. As I travel this country, speaking to groups all across the country, it's a whole bunch of people, reminds me of that scene from Scandal when Papa Pope said, uh, you running around to feel like it's daisies and bombs are going up all around you. That's what many of us are doing. What we have to be doing right now is aligning ourselves with other organizations and preparing ourselves to fight for what we've already gotten thus far. I'm not even talking about what's going to be coming down the pipeline in the future. Because the future survival of our community is at stake. Pick a city and it's happening. I'm tired of having gentrification conversations. If we know the damn land is for sale, let's buy it. I'm tired of us having conversations about, man, if only I could get some help building a business, well, if more of us actually show up, we can actually support and invest in somebody's business. What we are, the opportunity that we have is an enormous opportunity. And every decision that you make today, I need you to understand, you're not making that decision for you. Every battle that I fight every day has nothing to do with me and my company. It has to do with my nine nieces and four nephews. It has to do with their children that have yet to be born. Because we have to understand that if we are going to change the economic paradigm of this country, this generation of African Americans has to have the same guts and tenacity as foe who came before us. And it would be a shame 30, 40, 50 years from now and black America is still quoting Fannie Lou Hamer. If they're still quoting Constance Motley. If they're still quoting Diane Nash and Septima Clark. If they're still quoting uh, Ralph Abernathy and still quoting Andrew Young and Reverend Jackson. No, what should be happening, there should be a new generation of warriors who are on the battlefield fighting on behalf of African Americans because folks, we have been prepared for the opportunity, yet too many of us have shied away from it because we think we don't really have to do that stuff anymore. When we went after CNN, when I was on the board of the National Association of Black Journalists, I called Bernard Shaw, who passed away last year, and I said, Bernie, you spoke at our convention in Vegas, and I want to use a clip. This is what Bernard Shaw said to me. He said, Roland, Every generation has its time. It's now your time. It's now your turn. Not a single one of us, no matter what our age is, 
can shy away from this fight and this battle that we are engaged in. What this moment requires, it requires some of the smartest, most advanced, most well-funded African Americans in the history of our country to use its collective power to change the future economics of our community. If you were doing $20 million deals, go back home and challenge folks and say, when are we gonna start doing $200 million deals? And if you're doing $100 million deals, then say, when are we gonna push to do a billion dollar deals? And I am not interested in anybody saying, oh man, this stuff takes time. I had one of our black media folks say, oh, these things take time. I said, bruh, your ass 75. <laughs> Every day over 72 is a bonus day for you. I am 54 years old. I have no desire for anybody saying these things take time. We have waited long enough for stuff to happen. There has to be a fierce urgency and we must push and push and push and must be willing to challenge, willing to shout, willing to fight, willing to get in somebody's face. We'll do the stuff nice, but as they say, Proud Mary, hey, uh, we like it nice and rough. Sometimes you got to go there. So maybe if this generation of black America had a little bit more gangster in them, Maybe if we had, maybe if we were not as educated uh, as we are now, because it's amazing how the previous generation didn't have all our degrees, but they sure as hell had something else inside of them, but they were unwilling to accept the status quo. And every single one of us should leave here and say, what is it that I am willing and prepared to do to change this? So when you come back to this conference next year, there should be an accounting as to what changed from the previous year to the next year. Because if any person in this room comes back to this conference next year, the same way you are now, all you have done is wasted everybody's time. You must change, you must challenge, and you must fight, and again, as my frat brother Bertner Woodson Tandy said, he was an alpha, he said, we will fight until hell freezes over, and then we will fight on the ice. Thank <laughs> you.